Hello, everyone. It's Dr. Ahmad Khan here. Today, we have a special guest with us. Today, we have Dr. Manal Mukhtar, an IMG from St. George's Med School, who recently matched into categorical psychiatry at Central Michigan University. Today, I have I have requested her presence so that uh, she can uh, share some insight uh, into uh, psychiatry match, how competitive it has gotten, uh, a perspective from a Caribbean a non U.S. citizen med medical graduate, and what steps applicants in her position or in general IMGs, AMGs can take uh, to make themselves uh, a competitive candidate for psychiatry. Thank you, Dr. Mukhtar. Thank you so much for having me. So can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Manal, as um, you guys all have already learned. I am a Canadian citizen and I attended St. George's University for a medical school. I graduated um, in January um, and I applied for psychiatry this cycle, uh, which has definitely gotten more competitive. Um, but yeah, I thankfully and successfully have matched and I'd love to answer any questions. Very good. Thanks a lot again for spending time. So tell us a little bit about your journey from being a Canadian citizen to getting admission, a brief summary of getting admission into St. George's. Absolutely. Um, so it's it's not a surprise getting into Canadian medical school is very difficult. When I was applying, the rejection rate was about 89%. Um, so I tried, I tried my best at the MCAT. Um, trying to get a G good GPA, good extracurriculars, but things didn't work out in my favor. Um, and so it was either waiting an average of three cycles trying to improve, or, you know, I met with um, individuals at SGU who were very successful. They had great match rates um, and very good placements. And so I sort of made that informed decision that this would be a great way to maybe progress my career forward. At that time, I wasn't interested in research. So doing a master's didn't hold any meaning to me. Plus, it was extra money. Um, and so that's how I ended up going to SGU and did a few months on the island before the pandemic kicked us off. Um, and then did uh, the rest of the basic sciences from home. And then I did both my clinical years in Miami, Florida. Master in public health? Yes, so I, uh, due to the pandemic, the issues um, were that I sort of became an off cycle student um, and I started clinical rotations at um, an odd time. So I wasn't really with my graduating class, but I wasn't entirely um, finishing with the next class. So I had some time in between. I finished my uh, my medical school curriculum in August uh, 2023. And so I had all this time from then till, till July to do something. And then I, the school had offered us a master's of public health, which is accredited in the United States. And so I thought it was a great way to sort of learn a little more and get more involved into research as well. And uh, uh, the, uh, which school was that? St. George's themselves did or? Yes. Okay. That's, that's pretty. So, and how much time in total it took you to do MPH? Uh, so it's about three terms. Uh, the first term is four months. The second one is about two months. And then I'm entering my third term, uh, which is where we're working on our practicum and our capstone project. So it's very much dedicated and being um, self-driven. Now, from being a Canadian citizen and applying to Caribbean med schools, mm -hmm. uh, the rate of admission and everything, is it dependent upon your MCAT score, your GPA pre-med, or what factors do they consider? Yes. They consider pretty much everything that a U.S. medical school would. Um, they also have their own prerequisites, so you'd have to take them um, during your pre-med years and undergrad. Um, but apart from that, like they they do look at applications as a whole. Um, and so sometimes if they think that you may need a little more push with academia, they can put you into things like the academic enhancement program, um, or they'll give you like a like a foundations program before officially starting term one. So it gets you a little more primed for, for medical school. Um, and so they have a lot of options. And I felt, uh, personally, I felt very supported by the school. So I, I don't think it's a bad decision. Okay. All right. And uh, 
like U.S. government does, Canadian government also like offer that student loan uh, for Caribbean med school students? That's a great question. Uh, so it, you can get loans from your province. So in Ontario, we have OSAP, but realistically, it's not that much. A lot of Canadian students do have to um, turn towards loans. And most. And since we're studying internationally, we'll need our parents to be co-signers. Um, and it's it, it's a lot. Sometimes finances can be an issue. So often you, you might have family supporting you as well. Um, sure. And with the current interest rates in Canada, um, it can get a lot. So there is no like a centralized federal loans like the U.S. students can get? Unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, and my understanding is the fee structure of Caribbean Med School, again, I'm very naive about all, all that uh, setup. Is it is it more than uh, uh, the Caribbean Med School? They have more tuition fee as compared to the U.S. Med School or even Canadian Med Schools? Yes, they do charge quite a bit. Um, as even in the Caribbean schools, you can find some that are more cheaper than the others. Um, and so that could be something, you know, people could could look out for. Um, it is quite a bit. I think by the end of it, most people end up with about four to five hundred thousand dollars or um, worth of loans. Um, okay. and, yeah. So now in terms of the clinical rotations, do you get to decide? Because I have seen a lot of St. George's students in New York City, Chicago, uh, even Detroit area. So did you choose uh, Miami or it's like uh, like a draw sort of a ballot sort of a thing? Yes. So in our last term, before we start clinical rotations, they ask us to pick our top three locations. Um, and so you pick the states, you can't pick the hospitals, unfortunately. Um, and then again, it all depends on what is available at the time that you finish step one. So I finished up one at the end of September um, and I got my results two weeks after. So then according to what was available, they asked me. Um, and so I picked Miami because I was I was sure that I would be in the same area for at least my third year. I didn't want to move around a lot. Um, and so that's the decision I made. But um, they did have availability in Chicago and New York as well. And what I have seen and uh, I've heard from different St. George's students, a lot of them prefer New York City because it has more residency spots. Sometimes they would rotate in the same hospital. Uh, is that also true for Miami? Yes. Uh, so in Miami, typically, we have a lot of outpatient sites that are all around the city. Um, so you could be driving a little bit, but they have about two or three big uh, major of uh, major hospitals where you could do your inpatient rotations. Um, Jackson Memorial Hospital being one of them, but there's also uh, like North Shore Hospital and Jackson North as well. Um, but they try to locate you close to where, where you live. So it's not too much of a hassle getting around. So other than your clerkship rotations, did uh, you do any other like observership externship or did you have to do it or did you choose not to do? Is there option that do other Caribbean medical students do it? Um, so for us, our, because our two years of clinical rotations are built into our schedules, um, mm -hmm. you typically don't have to deviate much from that. Okay. Uh, however, given that I was an off-cycle student, what some students could have done instead of doing the MPH, they could have taken part um, of an extra um, extra clinical, um, it's, it's called the ECP. I don't remember what it stands for, but you, you're able to do uh, more clinical rotations uh, during that time. Um, it's a little more limited for Canadian students. If you are an American citizen or you have a green card, it, it'll be easier to do more with that. I understand. All right. So uh, when you are rotating uh, as a Caribbean medical student, do you also have U.S. medical students rotate with you? I, I'll be honest, I have pretty much only rotated with other Caribbean students. Okay. Um, at Miami is a site where a few other Caribbean students uh, or their schools, they send them there. Uh, okay. but I have heard that um, in sometimes in places in New York, New Jersey, uh, some of um, my counterparts have rotated with American medical students as well. So... Uh... Let's talk a little bit about what was your overall strategy for psychiatry, considering that it has been getting competitive with every passing year. Uh, what Did you like get a mentor from your med school and how did that person guide you and what was your overall approach? 
Absolutely. So I decided to do psychiatry well into my third year. Um, and so this wasn't something that I had planned for so long, um, which of course would help you because then you are able to target your plan towards that. Um, and uh, I re and what I've heard was that, you know, psychiatry is a field that looks for dedication to the field. So you need to show something on your application that, that shows it, sorry, that you are, um, that this is for you and this is what you truly want to do. It's not a backup specialty. Um, and so what I, first, what I needed to do was I needed to plan my electives. Um, and I ended up doing two sub internships in psychiatry. And then I did one medicine one as well, because um, I've heard program directors do also want to see how well you do in a specialty that you're not very interested in. Um, and so that's where I got my three letters from. And I have been told that my letters were very, were very strong. So that was a good supplement. Um, I needed to amp up my extracurriculars. I hadn't done much in medical school. And so I found out about the crisis text line. Um, I signed up for it um, uh, a couple of a couple months before applications were due, but I'm still a part of it. Um, it's been a great uh, sort of way to learn how to communicate with those who are um, suffering from uh, different kinds of issues. And then I also found out about Psych Sign. In fact, someone from my school uh, was the previous Psych Sign International Chair. She told me that I should run for their elections um, and thankfully got elected for that as well. And so that these were a couple of things that I was able to put on my CV, um, some of which were also leadership roles. So I think that's important. They, you should be committed to something and they want to see what you've done with that role rather than just having like a piece of um, a piece of something that's to show on your CV. Uh, as for mentorships, I didn't reach out to anyone from my school um, to guide me very thoroughly, but I I do recall I messaged you on Twitter back in October. And so that was, you've been such a great help. And I really urge students and potential applicants to make use of their, their social networks. Mm -hmm. I did not start getting involved on Twitter until well after um, applications were due. Um, and if I were to go back, I would be a little more active on things like LinkedIn, Twitter, um, even um, on Instagram and just sort of reach out, see who's there to help you because there's a lot more people out there than we think who are willing to take you on and guide you through every step of the way. This line you were referring to, is it the 988? Yes. Okay, all right. So you don't need to be a U.S. citizen to volunteer for that. So you could have, um, you could apply through the U.S. I wasn't a citizen, but um, uh, in their application, they want they need to check some history, and so because I had been at one of at my address in Miami for about two years, they were able to check and uh, like uh, verify that there was no like criminal history or anything. But for Canadians, there's also like a Canadian version of it. So you can also apply there. It's just I was in um I was in Miami at the time. And so that's what I picked. Um but I do think uh they they did ask for an SSN, but somehow they were able to take my application throughout um around it because I I was living there for about a few years. So that's how that worked out. Now, again, for the viewers who are watching, so if anyone wants to join PsychSign, is it through a website or what? Yes, for sure. Uh, we have our own website. I believe it's psychsign.org. Um, and you're able to join as a member. You're also able to join as an um, APA member as well. I believe it's free for medical students. Um, and then around April, May, we have our elections. So you're able to run for the region chair. For international students, of course, um, it would be the international chair, but they also have special interest chairs. Um, and these people, um, they would take on roles such as um, mentorship, uh, residency, research. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. Uh, you're also able to start a chapter at your own school. In fact, if you start a new chapter, you'll be noted as a founding member. And so that looks really great too. But if you have an active um, uh, student interest group at your own school. Uh, you can run for leadership positions there as well um, and just make an impact in your own community at um, at your own school. And you can really touch the different aspects of the application. Uh, any recommendations or suggestions on personal statement as a whole and then maybe uh, for psych specific? Yes, so personal statements are very important. Um, 
early on, I was told that, you know, do you think program directors have time to read all this? No, they don't. Just You, you can just write whatever. That's not true. Uh, they do read it. They read it very carefully. Every program director I've interviewed with has looked over my personal statement and has asked me questions about it. Um, so be honest, share your story, share why you want to do that. They're more interested in knowing you as a person through that personal statement, whereas just regurgitating your CV or um, trying to come up with something unique that might not fit very well or um, you know, may not relate to that person um, as a whole. Uh, for a psychiatry, definitely share why you want to do psychiatry. They, they're interested in knowing that. They want to see what your connection is to the field. Um, and it's a great way to, to little talk about yourself and talk about the experiences that let you there. Um, sometimes, um, uh, I remember I attended some of these recruitment fairs um, by Adpert, and they'd have schools that would uh, be there to share like, you know, about their programs. Uh, some programs actually would like you to tailor your personal statement to that program or to that location. Um, and so that's a great way to sort of get noticed if you are interested in these schools. Um, I, or well, you know, I would start by attending these fairs. First of all, you get to know more about their programs. And if you know that this program does really consider the personal statement, they want like a few sentences as to why you want to locate to that location or why you want to join that program, incorporate that. Maybe you'll get an interview out of it. Maybe they'll, they'll like it and be like, okay, this is person's convinced me that they want to come here. Okay. All right. Uh, and how was your experience with the signaling? Sorry, with the what thing? Signals. Signals, yes. Um, so for signals, I ended up getting interviews at three out of five of my signals. Um, and uh, in all fairness, two of them were like way too aspirational. Um, and so the advice I would give potential applicants is to be realistic, um, look at their websites, see if they have taken IMGs before. If they haven't, maybe you're putting your eggs in a basket that, you know, you won't really get much out of. Um, my recommendation is, is to probably pick mm -hmm. safety net programs. Um, so if you see, like for me, I see that a program has quite a few Canadians, I would probably apply there because um, in no way would I want them to miss me, but I would, um, that signal would also help them um, understand that I am very interested in their program. Um, so be realistic, be practical. Um, if you, you know, if you have a signal and you really like that program, even if it's a bit of a reach, maybe you can tailor your personal statement just for them to do you a little more. Um, but it's a great way to get noticed. So take full advantage of that. Yeah, and I, my experience personally uh, from on, on being the other side of it is that it, it does make a difference that, of course, if you're signaling uh, some programs, then it, it does mean that you are showing interest. So I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, in terms of uh, now there's a question that when you have signals, do you still send the letter of what they call LOI, letter of intent, uh, prior to applying to the match, like a brief email introducing yourself or even afterwards or in between? So I think a letter of interest doesn't do much harm. Um, I feel like even if you have a signal, um, you're shit, you're like telling them that, hey, I'm interested in you. Mm -hmm. But maybe after a couple of weeks, you don't hear back from them. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of harm in sending an, a, a letter of interest. Um, in fact, it may just solidify that, okay, this person sent us a signal, this person sent us an interest, a letter of interest. Um, let's see if we are able to offer them an interview. Um, I would definitely recommend it, especially for IMGs. Um, maybe, you know, a few weeks into the cycle, if you're not hearing back from any programs, the programs that you're realistically interested in, I would send them a letter of interest. Now, maybe a difficult question. So prior to applying for the match, uh, again, keeping in mind your credentials, including scores, personal statement, letters, uh, citizenship status, would you say that you got the same number of interviews you were hoping for, more or less? I think I got a little less. Um, and I, I preface this by saying that um, you know, you could, you try your best, you know, you're very active in leadership roles and extracurriculars, you get, you know, um, decent scores, um, you passed uh, step one, step two, first time, 
but I what I felt was that um, being a visa requiring M IMG sort of helped me back a little bit. Um, but again, what happens on the other side, I have no idea. Maybe there was another element of my application they didn't like. Um, one of them, I remember an interviewer saying that, you know, like your personal statement was well written, but I couldn't quite uh, get a grip on why you want to do psychiatry. Yeah. And so that's why I urge now like potential applicants to to really start preparing early and get that personal statement read by people in the field because they can offer you the best advice. Um, and of course, not requiring a visa, it's a benefit in itself. Being a green card holder is a benefit. But out of that, like those things are not in your control. Whatever yeah. is in your control, you need to work on that. And I, I agree again, not requiring visa. Of course, we know that there are a lot of programs that don't sponsor visa, but also Unfortunately, there are some programs who do offer visa, but they feel more comfortable because in all reality, we all know, I mean, practically in terms of uh, the visa issues, Canada is like the safest and I have never seen. Uh, but even still back of the mind, there's still something that we have to initiate the pr process and everything. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with that. Uh, in terms of mock interviews or interviews uh, preparation, what would be your uh, recommendations to the applicants? Um, absolutely. Mock interviews are really important. Um, doing mock interviews with someone that, again, is in the specialty you're interested in is also very important. Um, from what I've heard, I'm not too sure if this is correct, but medicine interviews are a little different than psychiatry interviews because medicine interviews are more likely to ask you about like specific case questions, how you would handle this patient. Um, it's not entirely like that in psychiatry. Psychiatry, what I've noticed is it's more behavioral. You know, if this were to happen, what would you do? If um, this patient were to behave like this and your attending wanted to do this, but you didn't want to do that, what would you do? So it's a little, um, they're more ambiguous, but overall I felt my interviews have been more conversational. It's been a little easy to just talk about things apart from whatever is in your application, because they already know that. But again, it's really important to run through your answers with a mentor, um, do a few mock interviews. They can tell you sometimes things may sound okay to us, but they may not sound too okay to someone else. And so you get that check um, and it's okay to be uncomfortable that first few times with the mentor, as opposed to, you know, potentially screwing up in front of a program that you have a fair chance at. Um, so definitely do mock interviews, especially for INGs whose English, um, whose first language is not English. Um, it's more important to uh, sort of get a flow on your answers. Um, and then of course not sound too robotic. But yeah, I think that's Actually, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I remember back in 2015, 16, when I was applying, mm -hmm. uh, I studied in English medium schools. I felt that my English is at least average. Uh, I was able to make a conversation. Uh, I was good at writing. So someone initially told me, one of my mentors at that time, that you should write answers to common questions and mm -hmm. prepare them. And I was initially a little bit surprised. Why would I do that? But then I realized that I should do it uh, mm -hmm. after talking to some people and I did it. And it really helped me because I would say even if English is someone's first language, sometimes just having a map in your mind really helps because sometimes again, and these are very like common questions, tell me about yourself, why psychiatry and stuff like that. Of course, they can ask you any question and then you have to answer, but at least some of these like the icebreakers, if you know what you wanna say, and even if there's a barrier, language barrier and all sorts of virtual interviews, if you have some, uh, map in your mind, I think it helps. So I absolutely agree with that. That really helps. Uh, yeah. Now, the next question uh, I have is that when you, a lot of people ask after interview about the thank you emails, thank, thank you cards, what's your experience with that? Um, I don't think it does any harm. Again, sending a nice thank you email, uh, thanking someone for their time, um, for their consideration. Um, it just shows that you're a nice person. Do I think it has an impact on your match or anything? I don't think so. I don't I don't know if programs read too much into it. Of course, I, I have no idea. Um, but I did send thank you emails uh, after my interviews. I just thought it's a great way to sort of wrap up that um, that uh, that interview and leave on a good note. Um, 
So of course it doesn't do any harm. I'm not sure if not sending it makes a difference. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think so, but uh, it okay. just shows that, you know, it's okay. the pleasant thing to do. Okay. And then at the end, when you were making a rank order list, did you also like send a rank order email kind of a thing? Okay, I had good experience. I am ranking your program high or whatever that was. Um, I did send a letter of intent, but I only sent it to one program telling them that it's my number one program. Okay. I did not send it to anyone else saying that I'm ranking you high. I think that's ambiguous language. Um, and mm -hmm. I was advised against it. Um, that being said, when you go in with that being your number one, uh, only do it in the case that you're for sure you're going to keep it as number one. I yes. feel like they give you four weeks and it's a lot of time to always second guess yourself, make changes. Um, so if you're not too sure, maybe not sending an LOI would be would be the right thing. But if you're like definite for sure, um, you can send it to them. Yeah, no, I would agree because we have all have had experiences where people would say, okay, and being on both sides of it. So yeah, so I'm not sure someone shared on Twitter that program director uh, gets to know about all the applicants that he ranks, where they match. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's true or not. Mm -hmm. if, if that's true, then of course, it's a small world. If you have told someone I'm ranking you number one and you don't match the <laughs> at their program while they have ranked you high enough, so people would know. And even if they don't get to know, it's a small world. So word usually gets out and I understand uh, the desperation we all have had, we ha all have gone through the process, but I think uh, in the hindsight, again, if we can try to stay positive and uh, try to balance everything out. Now, one very important question. So you reached out to me uh, during the interview season. And at that time, my understanding is that uh, you did not have a lot of interviews and you were in, in a position where you felt that I was not getting a lot of interviews. Uh, and that is situation with, a lot of us, a lot of especially IMGs in competitive fields. How were you able to muster up the courage to keep going, to keep your head high and stay positive? Um, that's a great question. Staying positive had been hard at a lot of points. Um, of course, you send your application at end of September. You don't know until March. This entire, I think, six months is, is very grueling. Um, but you have to keep going forward. You have to keep, um, you know, you have to try, you have to do whatever is in your control to to do your best, whether it's sending a letter of interest or it's, um, you know, like at, I feel like after you submit your application, there's not a whole lot you can do, mm -hmm. but you, you know, you have to just be, you have to stay positive. You have to, you have to, um, uh, how do I say this? take time for yourself too. don't lose all hope. Don't just, you know, sit and, and, uh, you know, let go of all your other activities, keep going, keep doing things that make you happy, be around your support system. Um, and, and yeah, reach out to reach out to mentors, reach out to people that could help you out because they, there are so many people out there that are there to support you that can help you out. Um, and you know, not if there's not a whole lot of people can like, if there's not a whole lot an individual can do, at least they can share a couple of nice words, encouraging words, um, just to get your uh, momentum a little higher. Uh, it's it's stressful. It's um, you've put so much money towards it. I completely understand. But uh, once the applications are in, do whatever is in your control, and then just leave it. Leave the rest to how how it's supposed to unfold for you. Anyway, uh, last question, uh, mm -hmm. not a human question. Any uh, last minute advice or suggestions for the IMGs overall and specifically the ones applying to psychiatry? For sure. Uh, just get started early. Uh, don't wait till like the last few weeks to, to write your personal statement. Uh, don't wait till the end to get your letters of recommendation. Starting, I believe, September 1st, ERAST takes five days to process your LORs and transcripts and everything. You don't want to wait in until September and then be stressed out whether this will process on time. Um, try to have a complete application before deadline, uh, before the ERS deadline. Um, but even if you even if you cannot, um, it's okay because you're able to update programs afterwards. So it's not the end of the world there either. Um, try to find a good uh, a good 
uh, mentor, good support system. It's very important because people know things that, um, you know, on the other side that you may not have thought of. Um, so that's very important. Um, and then again, whatever is in your control, try your best to do, to take that and do really well in it, whether it's studying for step two. Um, if you have time, you can even do step three, which will of course also be a really big plus to your application. Um, get good letters of recommendation, try to get some sort of research experience. I know psych is not typically a field where they consider research too much, but as an IMG, you want to beef up your application in a way where you stand out. Um, and so having some sort of research experience would help out a lot too. Um, other than that, just take care of yourself and what's meant for you will find you eventually. <laughs> good. All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mukhtar. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You as well.